Live from Earth, it's Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent to the stars. We've got an exciting show for you today where I am having a very special guest, Mike Simmons, the founder of of Astronomers Without Borders. Listen, this show lives on listener questions, but I don't have to answer the majority of questions today. Mike Simmons gets to answer the majority of questions today, which is how we like it. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern here at Spaceman Studios in New York City. So leave a voicemail to get yourself on the air. You can also follow along live with our space cadets tuning in live from around the world, including but not limited to Shorewood, Illinois, Budapest, Hungary, Portsmouth, England, Duluth, Minnesota, Howell, New Jersey. We've got... Vipava, Slovenia, we've got, oh my gosh, where we have London, UK, and London, Canada. Can we get a London, United States in there somewhere? Can we get all the Londons? That is my dream list. We got Washington, D.C., we've got Idaho Falls, Idaho. We have so many people, so many amazing space cadets tuning in right now. You can go to spaceradioshow.com to get the links where you can be a part of this conversation, where you are going to send questions, and then I'm going to pass them along to our special guests. Now, speaking of special guests, I do not want to waste any time today because we have Mike Simmons. He is the founder of Astronomers Without Borders. Mike has been an outreach astronomy program organizer for almost 50 years. He expanded his efforts to global communities and programs during the last 20 years, including 100 hours of astronomy in the International Year of Astronomy in 2009 and founding Astronomers Without Borders. He has received numerous awards for his work, including the naming of minor planet Simmons in his honor. I want a minor planet! How do, how do I do, who do I talk to to get that? I mean, I'll ask him. He is retired from a 36-year career in medical research at the UCLA School of Medicine. Mr. Mike Simmons, welcome to Space Radio. Thank you, Paul. What, what a great introduction. Uh, now I have something I can't live up to, so... <laughs> well, you have a minor plan. I, I have to start there. I have to start there. It's Tell a me very about minor the minor planet. You know what? Yeah. A minor planet is larger than no planet. It is. I've never seen it myself, actually. Some people have said they'd photograph it. Uh, you know what? It amounts to a certain amount of it. You either have to be really famous, which is not me, or really rich, or really beautiful, or something like that. Or, you know, people discover minor planets and they need somebody to name it after so uh, a friend of palomar actually got that name for me it was uh um i can't remember the name but uh, it'll come to me so yeah it was it, it was just one of those things i mean it's cool oh yeah oh you play it off of like like oh yeah someone just kind of named a planet after me you know nbd but but you've earned it you've earned it because you've done so much amazing work. Please tell me and tell the audience uh, about Astronomers Without Borders. How did you come up with the idea? What was your motivation? What were your goals? And how did those goals uh, evolve and change over the years? Okay, well, <clears throat> you know, that's probably a good cue for some pictures that I've got here that I can I can show you. If you want to know how things started out. So let, let me do that. You've given me the power to share here. So, you know, this this is it was actually eclipse chasing that got me started. And here you can see there's one person who is not like the others. Uh, this is an eclipse in Africa. And we always share when we go to eclipses, we share with the view with people in the eclipse glasses. This is an expedition tour I led in uh, Turkey. Uh, same one in, over in Egypt, uh, China, everybody gets into it. And <clears throat> this one was special because it was 1999. And I decided instead of going to Europe, like most people did, I went to Iran. And this is actually from a hilltop in a communication center in Iran, where people are using my little telescope to look at the partial phases. And people, uh, afterwards, the, the people I was even more distinguished with my gray beard there. I think that probably helps in Iran. And uh, students came up, they couldn't speak English, but they clearly wanted something. And I figured out they wanted my signature. It's like, 
And I didn't even have a minor planet named after me then. So it was just, I was an American scientist. And it turns out that the people in Iran are crazy about astronomy and the United States, the culture and so on. Forget about all the sound bites and all that stuff. Everybody wants to be here. They want their country to be like ours. And they love having Americans. This is my wife. Uh, you can probably, she is not like the others there, obviously being greeted at a girl's school. And uh, here's another thing. So this is something you might not know, Paul, and a lot of people. In Iran, it's, they're really astronomy crazy, but it's almost all women, or mostly women, and it's young people. And this is one of the things I found doing astronomy around the world, is that in most of the world, it is not us older guys like me, who are of a certain age, who have been doing this for a long time. It's young people, almost everywhere around the world. It's really very different. And they're doing face painting and other things. And uh, this is astronomy day there. So <clears throat> I also traveled to Iraq, took a telescope and some other things to the people there. And these are from a hundred hours of astronomy. I'll just go through these quickly because I like using this. I've used this ever since that, that uh, big event in 2009 because it shows the variety of people. We had probably a million people look through telescopes in one night wow. in the Global Star Party all around wow. the world as darkness swept across around the world. This is the telescope I took to Iraq with me in Baghdad. There were people out there in Bangladesh in a country I don't remember offhand in Kathmandu, Nepal, in India, in Iran, in Bolivia or Peru, I'm not sure which exact same telescope this was being used that same night over in uh, Kurdistan in Iraq where I'd, I'd left it. Back in the US of A, US of A, and in Argentina, small crowds and big, everybody gets into the act and uh, people love to share. This happens to be in Brazil. And, in, in, you know, this is why. This is why we do this. And I think you can say the same thing. The wows that you get, Paul, from the things mm -hmm. that you do are, it's not the same if you're not having them look through a telescope. You're telling them about things. You're telling the story of the universe, the story of where we are, where we belong. This is our neighborhood. This happens to be Romania, you know, but it doesn't make any difference because it's, it's, it's universal. So uh, that, that is it. Now, I had started Astronomers Without Borders before uh, the International Year of Astronomy got completely sidetracked. So it couldn't do anything then. So it really got going in 2010. And the idea was that I had, I had written about, talked about astronomy in Iran, which worked so well because people said, oh, geez, they, they love astronomy. They can't get telescopes. What can we do? It was just like people to people. None of this other stuff. I won't use any of the bad words for it, but you know, the, the, the untrue stuff about what's going on or the governments, the, the governments can mess up anything really. And <clears throat> so you get stopped on the street and people want to know who you are and why you're there. So I decided to expand it to other countries and it, it blew up. People love the idea that we are all crew members on spaceship earth. We're traveling around the cosmos. We're looking out different windows. So I see the stars tonight and you see the sun, but you know, 12 hours later, it's reversed and we see the same stars. And so that was the idea really to bring people together. That's so fantastic. Oh, why wasn't anyone doing this before? Yeah, good question. Well, <clears throat> I have talked to people that said, oh yeah, I had this idea. Um, I just happened to have spent a lot of time traveling and talking to people and writing and, 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 you know, I'm a little weird. I, I do things that other people are kind of like not sure about doing. And, uh, you know, I just started off by myself and, and it seemed to work out and people got behind it. And really it was a grassroots effort. It wasn't a central thing. It wasn't me telling people what to do. It was, the people in literally in Iraq and uh, I think it was Philippines, Vietnam, different places where they sort of got together and said, let's do this together. And I said, fine, it's a program. So it's really a grassroots thing. Yeah. How, what have some of the grassroots efforts you've found 
outside of the United States. Like you, you mentioned visiting all these amazing countries, showing them the wonders in the night sky, showing how we're all connected by, by this shared sky, by this shared experience. Uh, what's remained after you left? Well, what's remained like what, uh, first of all, I want to make it clear that, you know, I, 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 I've been in contact with and had involvement from people in maybe 150 countries. I haven't been to all those. I've been to some neat places, but it isn't about me and it's not about me going there. It's about the people that are already there because they're doing astronomy already. And so we just connect. It's just, it's like having a club, except, you know, instead of being based on geography, it's based on our interest. And, uh, so, uh, you know, we have done some things, and, I, and I'm starting a new, new organization. No, ha, haven't been in uh, AWB now for this year, but I'm starting something new to focus on some things where we had the ability to bring resources to people, to use astronomy for diversity and equity, mm. accessibility, and these things. So now I'm focusing on those things in particular and, and leaving something tangible. Sometimes... <clears throat> It, it is a telescope, but that's hard. The physical world is hard to do things in, but you can connect people and they can talk. You can give them hope. You can give them encouragement. You can make them part of the larger world by connecting with them. Uh, these things make a really big difference. You can, and, and support and encouragement is a very, very big part of uh, what can happen. Oh, for sure, for sure. What what got you uh, into astronomy yourself? I mean, you're such an amazing advocate for astronomy and such an amazing uh, evangelist for the night sky. Uh, how did you find your own passion here? Yeah, I get that asked that all the time, and the, and the short answer is I, I have no idea. I can't remember. It was too long ago. I mean, I, I have trouble remembering what I had for dinner two days ago. So I have been interested in astronomy my whole life. I remember being fascinated by Sputnik. I was seven years old. Um, and uh, I was crazy about the space race and going into space. I watched uh, Alan Shepard as many times as I could on the first American suborbital flight. There were no DVRs then. I had to click around to every news channel to watch the launch again. And... I don't, I don't really know. I don't remember. It's just always fascinating. The earliest I remember, I was uh, less than 10, maybe seven or eight. Be oh, before wow. that, it's just, it's like, you know, the beginning of the universe. Like, right. Yeah. It's just, ever. it's just always been with you and, it's, and, and yeah. it's what's enabled you to share this passion and this joy. How many, we have some, some questions from the chat. How many questions have you personally visited as a part of Astronomers Without Borders? And then how many countries currently have active chapters or volunteer organizations associated with Astronomers Without Borders? Uh, you know, I don't have good answers to either of those for, for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> One is uh, the traveling and the international stuff started before Astronomers Without Borders. It's the AWB is a result of it. And I've traveled to more countries. What I've had this tremendous opportunity because doing this and people said well look at this guy he has a minor planet whatever that means and uh they would they would invite me to so i've i've had the opportunity to travel quite a bit um to be a guest at various places to to try and help them and and encourage them uh and and that is really a humbling experience um I don't know, maybe been to 40 or something like that, but there's some I've been to quite a bit. I was going to be in Brazil this year for, I think, the eighth time because they invite me every year. <laughs> but, I, you know, then COVID happened. Um, as far as active chapters, we never really started chapters. It, it's, the thing is that the formal organization doesn't necessarily fit. We're talking here about people who are doing the same thing from the same place. I mean, we're on earth. That's really the thing that matters. It doesn't matter which country we happen to be in. So we have different languages and things like that. But like I said, I, I, I really always like to just try and support what is going on as a grassroots thing, rather than saying, we, we, this, is, this is what we're gonna do. I've just always listened to what they wanted to do. 
and nobody really makes a distinction. Now there are some groups that have formed. You said, "Can we you can we be a chapter?" And I said, "You know, damn, you're a chapter." And <laughs> you know, go use our logo and go do something. And some I can show you some of these two amazing things in many really great countries where they use astronomy for really good things. And I've become more of an evangelist of astronomy for good it, as, as, as I go more now than I was before, because I've seen so much good come from it. For sure. For sure. Uh, how, how I get, I get a question a lot. And so I'm going to bounce this question to you. People get interested in the night sky, but they live in a highly light polluted area. They don't really get to see the constellations a lot. They hear about like phases of the moon or like Jupiter's in the sky tonight, but they don't really know what they're looking for. Uh, How can people get started um, uh, learning more about the night sky, especially if they live in a highly urban or suburban area? Yeah. And people get the idea. There are two sides of this coin. One is that people don't realize that we have lost our connection with the night sky in many ways. It's only been 100 years or so that we've had electric lights and just drowned everything out. It's like cutting down all the trees and and nobody knows what a forest is anymore. Um, But the sky is still there. You can see a few stars. You can see the brighter planets at just about any place on Earth. Uh, and, and I think learning the planets is probably the best thing. The constellations are just, I don't know, I don't get as thrilled by them as some others, but everybody has their own way of looking at this stuff. But follow the motion of the planets. You know, when you look at the moon and you learn why it's going through phases and you watch it move and go through phases, you are looking at its orbit around the Earth as we orbit around the sun. And then you look out like, tonight, just about everywhere, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and you can watch how they move. And you can actually visualize, you can track this, like the ancients did, that you can see how they're orbiting around, how some are passing by us because they're closer to the sun going faster, other ones that are farther out. I I just love doing that. It doesn't take any optics at all to see how our solar system works and to watch it. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it really is that simple. And, and I think that's what has been so powerful in you being able to connect with so many communities around the world is because you can just look up or just look through a telescope and just be blown away by by the mysteries and the vastness and the expanse of the universe. Uh, yeah. When you look through a telescope, what do you like to look at? Well, <clears throat> you know... I'm terrible at picking favorites. I, this is one thing I've learned. Oh, yeah. I'm going to make you do yeah. it. Okay. Okay. Um, I've had the chance to look at, through telescopes up to 200 inches. Um, and I still think that looking at the planets up close mm-hmm. is one of the most exciting things. Mm-hmm. I mean, perhaps the most exciting observation I ever made actually was naked eye when I saw M31, the Andromeda galaxy for the first time. And knew that, I don't know what the latest is, one and a half, two, two million years ago. Who, who cares? It's a long ways out there. <laughs> uh, seeing that light with my own eyes, with no yeah. optics. But, you know, anytime I look through a telescope, just a, you know, a three-inch telescope and see Saturn's rings and just look at it, it's just a marvel. So in the features on the moon, I started my first optics with my grandfather's binoculars. Wow. And... I used to sort of try to hold them steady and look at features on the moon and uh, how it changes. So I I really was a deep sky guy for a long time. I knew all the faintest galaxies and everything, but I think I've come full circle and back to the local neighborhood here in the solar system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I hear you. I love, I love the plants. I remember the first time I got a look at Saturn through a uh, decently sized telescope and it, that memory is burned. That image is burned into my brain of, of seeing the rings of Saturn for the first time. It's absolutely beautiful. Oh yeah. Um, what, how can people support astronomers without borders and how can people be a part of astronomers without borders? Well, 
you know, as I said, I, I've left there uh, earlier this year. Uh, they have to go to the website, astronomerswithoutborders.org, and, and see what's happening and see what they can do. Um, I think, you know, I always used to say that just uh, joining, which was, was completely free, um, because otherwise people around the world can't afford to do it. I mean, it's impossible. And being a part of the community, whatever, whatever programs are going on, so you can check it out there and see what's, what's happening. All right. That's, that's astronomerswithoutborders.org. And uh, before we go, we have a few more minutes. I just, I love picking your brain. I would love uh, to take you out to dinner sometime when uh, coronavirus is all over and we can travel yeah. again. Um, yeah. I, I really want to know, and this is a question from the chat, and it's a beautiful question. You've encountered dozens, if not hundreds of communities. You've opened up people people's eyes of all ages all ethnicities uh it, it doesn't matter who they are they can enjoy yeah. the nice guy you, you've done this tremendous work in in sharing this experience with communities around the globe is there any one or two moments that really stick out to you as especially unique or relevatory or or special uh when in your work with astronomers without borders Wow. Geez, that's one question. It's surprising me. I'd never really been asked that before. <clears throat> and, and, and I've been to, I don't know, many hundreds of different places, the communities, um, individual things. I think, you know, what really strikes me is how universal it is, how it's in every culture. I've been to ancient, you know, I've been to Babylon. It's now in Iraq. And I've been to you know, uh, Persepolis with a friend who's an archaeologist in Iran, and, and, and all of them have astronomy. So I'm struck by the overwhelming uh, involvement of astronomy in all the different cultures. But the, the things in particular that were really striking, um, I think after a while it becomes that it's it's so much the same everywhere. Mm. Uh, there are some places that are doing fantastic things in Africa and other places. I, I, this is, I'm not usually stumped, but I'm having a little <laughs> I did it. coming up with one I thing. Did it. We did it. We did it, <laughs> folks. We have stumped Mike Simmons. Um, oh, these communities that you've opened up to the night sky, that you've been able to share this joy and this passion, what do you think we need to do next? What's the follow-up? How do we preserve the night sky? How do we preserve that access? How do we keep these efforts going? Yeah, preserving the night sky is really important. The International Dark Sky Association just had that uh, uh, darksky.org. They just had their annual uh, conference. <clears throat> and like so many others, they had to go online. And I, I, I was delighted to be able to help get them uh, speakers from all around the world to talk about their efforts in their areas. I've seen that quite a bit. It, there are many different ways in which light pollution is bad for us. The, the new blue LEDs are really bad health-wise, um, but there are things that we can do to make those better. Uh, those are the experts there. Uh, I, I think that what is needed, I mean, one of the things that I've done when I, when I was younger, we talked about think globally and act locally. And that's really important. Climate change, for example. We think about the planet and we do what we can where we are. But at the same time, we can turn that around too and think about what we're doing locally and act globally. We can connect with others. It is the sheer mass of people and grassroots movements that really makes the difference. So we have to think both ways and we have the ability to do that now. So check out darksky.org and see what you can do there. As far as sharing astronomy, well, that's that's what it is. You know, I go to places where there is astronomy. So I'm not, I'm not being dropped into the middle of a forest where nobody's ever seen the sky before. There are people there who are active and they want to reach more people. And I love to be able to help them do that. And sometimes just dropping in like this weird guy from another planet and it makes a difference. Um, but I think connecting with others and share it with others, it is rare to find somebody that isn't 
so fascinated by a look through a telescope, uh, learning about something. I get quests just like you do, Paul. I mean, if somebody it looks at you and says, you're an astronomer, aren't you? I've got a question for you. I read this in the, 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 the Inquirer or something, and they want to ask you a question about aliens. And, you know, the other thing is astronomy clubs. Um, that's the best way to get started is to join a club. And if there isn't one, start one. I guarantee you, I see it all the time. There are others around you that love astronomy too and will join in. Yeah, absolutely. And and there are ways to access uh, online telescopes through Astronomers Without Borders, isn't there? Well, I not, you know, we partnered with many different uh, companies and organizations that have those I've never tried to duplicate what other people are doing. We just, if we work together, we can do a lot more. So there are a lot of things out there that are remote uh, observatories. We even had a program in uh, 100 Hours of Astronomy during the international year. It was 2009, and it was, you know, this was, I mean, the first remote observing I ever saw was through dial-up. And uh, oh. there were toll calls. And so, you know, it was expensive. So. Um, it's really easy now. There are a lot of places out there. There are forums on Facebook and every place where people share what they're doing. It's just, it's infectious. So you, if you've been bitten by the bug, then find your support group and there are others like you out there. And, you know, there are other ways too. Uh, I love the astro arts, space art. Uh, there are many ways that that has been done. People who just see uh astronomy see the sky in a different way it isn't the science they aren't astrophysicists they're artists and some of them i know one engineer who became an astronaut and is now doing art she's an artist nicole stott the the, the artistic astronaut and, and you know we just see the universe through it, our own perspective and every one of those is valid every one of them is personal but we all have that universe within us in some way. We just perceive it and express it differently. Uh, I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, before we go, I do have one question. We were chatting before the show. You know this this show can get a little cheesy at times, if you know what I mean. So I have to ask you, I have to ask you, what's your favorite kind of cheese? Oh, Boy, I, you know, I was not prepared for this. I feel mm, like I was ambushed, mm, mm. Paul. Uh, you told Nancy the ambush interview. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> I used to eat a lot of cheese. Uh, I haven't done it for quite a while. I, I know you may never have me on again as a result of that. Um, but I love the sharp cheeses. All right. And uh, so some of them, uh, you know, some has a real tang to it. And then also... My wife makes faces, but when I have an, an aged cheese, yes, you know, a Roquefort, I just like, I'll take it off of her salad because she doesn't want it and I'll put it on mine. So <laughs> I just kind of go to extremes one way or the other. I understand. I understand. Uh, Mike Simmons, thank you so much. It's been an honor to have you on this show. It's been wonderful to chat with you. Uh, uh, I hope you have some clear skies tonight. Thank you very much, Paul. It's always great chatting with you. All right. Thank you so much. So, uh, Space Cadets, don't go. Uh, I'll still, I, we, I've got cheese tonight. Don't worry, Space Cadets. And uh, we are going to, uh, I need to tweak something in the background. Here we go. Okay, there we go. And, and yeah, I, I noticed in the chat there were some questions about what's going on with Arecibo. So, let me get my cheese out today. This cheese is provided by Dom's Cheese Shop. You can go to domscheeseshop.com. And Nancy, will put the links in both the show notes and the chat. Thank you so much to these wonderful sponsors. Today I have, oh my gosh, every week they give me the most amazing cheeses. Check this out. This is, I'm not going to pronounce it correctly, so don't even bother correcting me. This is a Colin Hawker or Colin Hawker. Look at that label. With that creepy old lady right there. I love it. Holler Hawker. What would this is? It translates to sitting in the cellar because that's what it does. Is washed in wine and spices, aged for a minimum of 10 months, providing a remarkable depth of flavor. It is firm yet creamy, and it's a wonderful melter and is great for an extra exciting grilled cheese. That's why I'm doing with the stuff I don't eat. I'm going to have grilled cheese with this tomorrow. Thank you. 
or a way to liven up your fondue. Wow. Yes, as a flavor veering more in the butterscotchy direction. I love this. I'm just with more nuttiness and less fruit. Oh, man. Here we are, holler hawker. I've never even heard this. This is why I love Dom's Cheese Shop because I've eaten a lot of cheeses in my life. I've traveled a lot. I've sampled a lot. I've eaten cheeses that I can't pronounce before, but then I go to Dom's Cheese and I get cheeses I've never heard of before. And that's why I love them. And yes, they do ship. You can order online for your holiday. Look at that slice. Look at that. You know, there's a joke, only the Swiss can sell you a cheese that has holes in it and charge you more. But you know what? It's because it's really good. So I'm gonna slice off a little bit here. It is firm and creamy, I can tell. Here we go. Wow. Wow. Mmm. It is like, I've had some good Swiss cheeses. Wow, this is like a Swiss cheese on steroids. This is like, if Swiss cheese had a king or queen, royalty, this is the royalty of Swiss cheeses. This is like rules over all those peasant Swiss cheeses that you buy at the deli section of your supermarket. Those are the unwashed masses. This is, mmm. These are purple robed royalty. That's a good cheese. Thank you, Dom's Cheese Shop. Mmm. And I get it, Tom Buck. If I'm surely, surely, like someone like pops into this show towards the end of it, like, oh, cool, an astrophysicist is answering space questions. I'm sitting here gushing about cheese. Very confused. But welcome to Space Radio with Paul Sire. That's how we do it. Now, Arecibo. A second cable on the air. You know, Arecibo is this giant radio dish in Puerto Rico. It's the famous, it's the one in contact, right? It's this giant, it's like part of a valley, it's huge. Uh, they had a cable break like a week or so ago, and then they had a second cable break. And it seems like the decision is made to just decommission it. Arecibo, I'm going to say this, I'm going to tell you, as is famous, it's iconic. I think it was in a James Bond movie too, if I remember right. It um, it hasn't been a part of relevant cutting edge science for like a few decades. It's been hanging on for nostalgia's sake. We have so much better radio telescope technology. We have interferometers around the world. Uh, you, it turns out you don't need a big fixed immobile dish like that to do a lot of cool science. You need uh, much more agility for the kind of problems we want to work on. And besides, we have fast in China now, which is a giant valley that has been turned into a radio telescope so we have a like an Arecibo 2.0 we just don't need anymore so I am not all that heartbroken I've actually been kind of waiting for this for a while and I'm surprised it's taken so long so yes there is sentimental value there but Arecibo has not been a major player in astronomy for decades and that's simply the way it is and and my heart goes out to all the people who are working on it, the engineers there or like engineer whoever's left but it's time to move on. If you want to move forward, you got to let go of the past, right? That's how we do it on Space Radio. Listen, I have autographed books available. I have merchandise, these hilarious mugs that say if it's interesting, it's probably wrong. And yes, Nancy Graziano suggested I also have a mug that says science is for sharing. I'll get around to that. But this was the cynical one was the first priority. You go to pmsutter.com slash store and you can keep this show going by going to patreon.com slash pmsutter to find out how you can contribute. And thanks to Dom's Cheese for the free cheese. I love it. I love it. And I love you. And as, as long as you keep giving me cheese, when that stops, the love stops, let's be honest. And thank you so much to Mike Simmons for joining me in this wonderful conversation. Thank you to Space Cadets. Oh my gosh, thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter. Thank you to Nancy Graziano for wrangling the Space Cadets and producing this show and arranging the interview. Catch the live streams every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Visit spaceradioshow.com. You can also find me on social media, all channels, at Paul Matt Sutter. And of course, thank you, Space Cadets, for listening. I will not see you next week. We will be off for the Thanksgiving holiday, so I will see you again in two weeks where we will answer more of your burning questions and eat some more cheese. 
And remember, science is for sharing. End of transmission. How do I hit stop with all this cheese?